All right, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Chris Lytle. Uh, I'm the Deputy Director uh, at Systems for Action, uh, which is a, a signature research program at the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation. Uh, we focus on uh, systems level um, mechanisms with the intent to um, better align health in social services uh, in order to improve um, population health outcomes and achieve health equity. Um, so this is our uh, research in uh, progress webinar uh, where we give uh, grantees an opportunity to uh, share some of the great work that's, uh, uh, that's going on under the S4A banner. Um, but before we get into that, I do wanna make a quick announcement. Um, while I have a captive audience. Um, we have an open call for proposals um, for um, systems level uh, alignment. Um, if folks are interested in uh, applying for that opportunity, um, they're two year, uh, they're over two years, um, up to $250,000 each. Um, I look forward to seeing all of the um, amazing research proposals, but bear in mind that um, the CFP closes, um, the deadline is November the 6th. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, get on that. Um, so moving on to um, our, uh, our, our researchers. Um, first I'll um, introduce uh, Ashley uh, Humany. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, Ashley Humany. Uh, She's a Benefits Data Trust Healthcare Innovation Lead um, and is responsible for driving BDT's healthcare strategy and managing new and current partnerships. Uh, and if we go back to Clem, sorry. Uh, Clem John uh, leads the strategy team to stand up Pennsylvania's new managed care services through innovative services and community partnerships with the goal of aging participants uh, in their communities. Uh, next. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Kinski, uh, the Director of Research Translation and Capacity Building at UPMC's Center for High Value Healthcare. Uh, she has 20 years of experience implementing and evaluating both community and clinical based healthcare initiatives. And Rachel uh, Cahill, um, she's a nationally recognized expert in public benefits enrollment. Um, specializing in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, otherwise known as SNAP. Uh, and they'll be talking about connecting vulnerable seniors to nutrition assistance through a managed care plan. Uh, and I'll go ahead and pass it over to them. So hi, um, this is Clement John from UPMC Community Health Choices. And um, as my introduction said, I work for the strategy team. I'm the project manager and we are looking to, can everybody hear me by the way? Yep. Yep. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, I, um, as the introduction said, I am, um, I am the project manager for the strategy team and we are the ones that are actually looking at the rollout, thinking about how we can implement these services to our most vulnerable population. So today I will really focus on introducing you folks to um, Community Health Choices, the new managed care program the state of Pennsylvania rolled out about a year ago and what we are actually focused on. So. Um, about 10 years ago, the Department of Health um, and Human Services in the, in the state of Pennsylvania um, wrote out a um, poll to see um, where, 95, where um, Pennsylvania seniors like to live. 95% of the seniors said they would rather live in their homes and community than going into nursing facilities. Unfortunately, um, about 47 of them are actually currently living in nursing facilities right now. And so as we were thinking about home and community-based services, we really wanted to know why we're in a majority of our seniors aging at home. And we found out that there are a lot of barriers why. And um, when we wrote out the managed care, 
we're actually looking to remove those barriers that these seniors face so that they can all age in their community. So um, that really brought about what community health choices is. And it's really um, a non-clinical service working in a clinical setting. That's sort of how we always posit it. And we say it's a non-clinical service because we are really looking at home and community-based services. All our claims are really looking at, we, we try to work outside of the me medical model. We use a lot of our social determinants of health and all those barriers. Those are the things that community health choices really focus on. Our population is really, really unique. We look at um, older persons, as in individuals who are older than 21 years of age, um, who has Medicare and Medicaid, and also a person with disability. So when you look on the right, there is a really um, nifty sign that we have that talks about, um, are, you 20, um, are you eligible for community health choices? If you are over the age of 21, yes, you may be eligible. Um, if you are uh, under 21, then no, you are not. And then do you receive Medicare or Medicaid? And um, also, do you receive Medicaid LTSS services, which is long-term services and support? And that is one of our really interesting population because the people that receive Medicaid only, the LTSS and support are um, some of our um, individuals who happen, who's had traumatic um, TBI, traumatic brain injuries. Um, some of them are individuals with with disabilities, basically, and um, those are our main population. Currently, in the state of Pennsylvania, we have about 40, I would like to say 450,000 participants who are currently eligible for community health choices now. So what are the income requirements? It's a Medicaid product, so of course there's an income requirement where you have to be 133% um, over the um, under the federal income poverty guideline, and then individuals who are 65 or older, blind, disabled, and of also um, in need of medical assistance. Um, the financial impact is one person will have to make about $2,400 a month, or for two people, it will be an, um, about $3,200 a month. Currently, um, community health choices, when we wrote this out, we wrote it out in three phases. We are currently in our second phase, getting ready for the third phase. So the first phase was um, the southwest, the green area, and it really focuses on Allegheny County and the other 13 surrounding counties. Um, the second phase was the southeast, which is Philadelphia, and the five surrounding counties. And then the third phase, which is our biggest rollout, is going to be all the blue section, the northeast, north, northwest, and Lehigh Cap. The southwest rolled out in 1-1-2018. The southeast rolled out in 1-1-2019. And the rest of the state will roll out in 1-1-2020. What is really interesting about this rollout is the rest of the state has one of the largest um, discrepancies that we've, we've seen. As in, um, it's a large landmark. It's a large land mass with um, small population, but it's really dispersed. So we are currently looking at ways to connect those members that we will be having in some, to plug them into services. So this is our membership breakdown. And this breakdown is between the Southeast and the Southwest. We have a projection of what we will have in the South and the rest of the state, um, the Lehigh Cap region, but we are not I'm talking about them yet. So. Um, we currently have um, a total of about 73,000 members, and out of that 73,000, about 23,000 of them are receiving some kind of LTSS services, which is long-term services and support, which means that they are receiving some kind of home and community-based care. So um, these are individuals that are living in their homes and communities, and what we are doing is we are wrapping them up with services to age them safely in their homes so that they don't um, end up in the nursing facilities. And some of the services that we provide is, includes personal assistance services where we pay for home care and home, home, home care aids to take care of, personal care services to take care of them in their home. We also pay for home modification where if you have barriers in your home, if you have stairs, 
or if you have um, a bathroom that's unaccessible because of your wheelchair or you cannot get in your bathtub, we are able to remodel those fans to make sure that you can get to those places safely. We also do a lot of um, a lot of um, our meals on wheels to our members who are, are, are meal insecure. Um, we have um, a set, a set, our population is broken down to the Medicaid, Medicaid only, UPMC aligned, and not full risk. And I'll get into a little bit of that. The Medicaid only are, of course, our participants that um, are, of course, as it sounds, Medicaid only. So we are at full risk for them. Um, we have to. We have about five. 5,000 Medicaid only membership. Um, the full risk membership are the ones that have a, um, UPMC Medicaid and a UPMC um, Medicare. So it could be UPMC for life and then a UPMC um, Medicaid um, for you. And then the not full risk are the individuals that have UPMC Medicaid and have another managed organization such as Aetna or any of those for Medicare, or they can also have Medicare um, fee for service. Currently, um, between the between the southeast and the southwest, we have about um, almost I would like to say seventy percent of our population are English speaking. In the Philadelphia area, we have um, a, a wider di a, a wider selection of languages, including Russian, um, Korean. Um, we have a large Chinese population in the Philadelphia area. But uh, most, the most dominant language we have right now is English speaking, as you can see. So um, at CHC, um, Allegheny County actually is one of our biggest, um, our biggest pop our biggest population centers. And then the second portion, the second is Philadelphia. And as we go into the third rollout, we anticipate um, places like Erie and Scranton really having a strong background, a strong um, membership base over there. So what are the goals for community health choices? Um, when the state rolled this program out, the goal was to provide settings in the least restricted, provide services in the least restricted environment possible, which is um, a person's home and their communities. And so we wanted to age everyone in place and rebalance the long-term um, care system. Um, when we rolled out the long-term system, was the cost was the long-term system was costly, and the goal of community health choices is to actually contain those costs. And of course, we want to transition our members who are currently in nursing facilities to come outside of nursing facilities and to age them in their homes, respectively. One of um, one of the um, items that UPMC CAC really focuses on is um, working to identify our participants who are eligible for SNAP, LIHEAP, and um, PTRR, which PTRR, um, which is um, property tax and rental um, assistance. Property um, property tax and rental rebate. And when it comes to those programs, we have we actually looking at different ways of connecting those uh, members who are in need of these services and we make sure that we are connecting them because that's the most important when it comes to aging in place um, that is the most important thing we are finding the barriers are housing and of course um, as the weather changes heat and energy assistance and of course snap so um, we UPMC CHC we are really focused on targeting those memberships that we have who are eligible for those items for those services and actively providing those services to them. So I, I will turn it over to the next person. Hi, it's Ashley. Let me grab the screen here. All right. Sorry about that. Awesome. Thanks, Clem. Um, 
Again, uh, like Glenn mentioned, my name is Ashley Humany. I'm the Healthcare Innovation Lead at Benefits Data Trust. Uh, we're a national nonprofit. I will talk a little bit more about that and the organization later, but really wanted the chance to kind of pick up the ball from Clem to talk about what it means to care for duels, um, especially, as he mentioned, you know, when they're aging in place, a little bit more difficult to engage, um, often hidden to the system overall. Uh, so wanted to talk about what it can mean to provide access to supports that can really help treat those individuals as whole people, so not just members or patients in the, in the medical sense. And UPMC is such a pioneer in this area, and we're so honored to partner with them. Um, there are amazing interventions and programs that address the social determinants of health, like Clem Ken, Ken mentioned, transportation, heating, uh, environment generally. Um, and for this intervention that we're partnering on, we wanted to talk about one that takes a truly population health approach. And we're defining that to mean addressing health at scale, treating an entire population or cohort, uh, cohort of members. Um, so we at BDT often call this the money slide because it really demonstrates how connecting individuals to benefits programs like SNAP, which is the federal food assistance program um, previously referred to as food stamps, uh, it results in significant health savings and significant reduced care utilization. And there are references to all these studies in the appendix. Uh, I really wanted to point out SNAP's impact on large cost drivers in healthcare. So you'll see that's here about reduced ER visits, um, nursing home usage, pres prescription adherence. The first uh, bullet point here is actually a study that BDT participated in, and the numbers around cost savings per year for duels um, for healthcare, $1,800 a year per, per member or so. So those are significant numbers, and SNAP really has a, uh, the power to make, obviously, a, a great difference. So, but wow, are we leaving benefits on the table and doing a disservice to those who deserve them because there are tremendous gaps in access to these programs. Um, Seven million individuals nationally are eligible but not enrolled in SNAP. A huge percentage of seniors who are eligible for it are not enrolled. Um, working poor, eligible families for um, another benefit called Women, Infants, and Children, which supports prenatal and early um, childhood and maternal health, also large participation gaps. And why is this? There are many barriers to access. Some are just casualties of a complicated system, um, long and complicated applications, not a lot of education about what these benefits are and who are eligible. Um, and there's, among folks, really fear of um, the, stig the stigma of being on these programs or what it means to even, they feel like they're taking these benefits away from others. So um, there are a host of reasons and barriers to overcome. Uh, so our mission at Benefits Data Trust is to really break down these barriers um, to enable everyone who's eligible for these programs to connect to them. And we do this at scale and by using data and technology in a in a unique way. So we're a national nonprofit, and while we do a lot of things, uh, our core work is doing targeted outreach to those who are eligible for but unenrolled in host, you know, a host of benefits like SNAP, like LIHEAP, Medicaid, prescription assistance. We have a multi-channel contact center where our specialists walk through the entire application with the individual once we connect with that individual, and that is kind of our special sauce. So we not only find you where you are, but help with walking through the application, tell you that you're likely eligible, work with documentation assistance, and do a lot of hand-holding. Um, so as you can kind of see at the beginning of BDT's journey on the right, we use federal, state, and local data, and often healthcare data in the case of our partnership with UPMC, to cross-reference lists and find those who are on certain benefits and not others. And then we outreach to them using mail, text, app on calls, all with highly tailored messaging. And when we get these folks on the phone, we use a case management platform and technology to screen them, apply from as many benefits as possible, and submit them on, um, on their behalf. So that is the most cliff notes way of describing BDT, but it's kind of um, the most important aspect of our work besides the research um, that uh, is allowing us to uh, partner with UPMC to connect their members to these critical and essential supports. 
So just a quick slide on BDT's overall impact from a direct service perspective. Um, as I mentioned, we work at scale. So we've been around for about 15 years. In that time, we've submitted over 850,000 applications on behalf of individuals who are eligible for them, um, providing $7 billion and more in benefits delivered um, to those individuals in need. We provide direct service in six states. Pennsylvania, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, New York, and Colorado, and we're always looking to expand. Um, so we're able to kind of deepen our, our impact and help more people. So the other huge pillars of our work uh, are really centered around research, policy change, uh, policy advisory, technical assistance, and technical solutions. So you know, we really can't advocate for benefits access without trying to change the policies and practices that are currently making it devastatingly hard to access these benefits. And so I would, while I'd love to talk about all of these aspects of our work, our topic of the day is transformative research. So I'll breeze over BDT's history and research here. So this isn't the comprehensive list, but ones that are most relevant. Um, biggest, I would say kind of the most relevant and one of our most, um, impactful study to date is the first one on this slide. So we partnered with Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, the Maryland Department of Human Services and others to look at how SNAP enrollment impacted uh, the, the cost of care and outcomes and utilization for duels in the state of Maryland. And SNAP participation, we found reduced the likelihood of nursing home admissions by 23%, hospitalization by 14%, um, further analysis of this population specifically, uh, $1,800 to $2,000 in annual per member savings, which is huge. Some other research really showing the effectiveness of outreach and assistance um, in garnering higher response rates, especially among highly vulnerable populations, that second bullet there. And then currently, we're doing a few things. We're working with Dr. Seth Berkowitz, um, who's at UNC, to look at the impact of SNAP enrollment again on just Medicaid costs in the state of North Carolina. We currently work there. And then we're also studying the impact of um, data ma matching and text nudging strategies to improve access to women, infants, and children's benefits. Um, that's in partnership with um, our wonderful friends, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And then uh, the, the topic of the day is our partnership with UPMC. Um, and their Center for a High Value Healthcare to understand the cost and utilization impact of the campaign um, we're, we're performing with UPMC to enroll their dual, dual, uh, dual eligible members into SNAP and other benefits. So BDT has actually had been in conversations with UPMC Community Health Choices and leadership there and actually Pennsylvania Department of Human Services, who's a longtime partner of ours, about this type of collaboration since 2016, and it became a reality closer to 2017, 2018. And uh, BDT, well, we do work with healthcare organizations, be they managed care organizations or providers to connect members and patients to key benefits. And this collaboration with UPMC um, is a standard example of that. So uh, we are identifying UPMC's CHA CHC members who are eligible for but not receiving SNAP um, by matching those lists. Uh, we have a list that from the state that is Medicaid folks not on SNAP and we cross reference that with our UPMC member list. We're conducting targeted outreach to those members and then providing comprehensive application assistance to members once they call into. You know, we urge them via letters and um, to call into our contact center and we do the range of soup to nuts application assistance. So before I pass it over to Suzanne to talk about, you know, how we are able to think about the impact of this work um, and its future, the potential for future impact, I wanted to highlight quickly why um, and just why this is so special and just how amazing of a partnership this is. Um, and I wanted to highlight a few of them talk about them in the context of the challenges that we often face um, with these types of partnerships and that we face as caregivers, health systems, caretakers of our community. So firstly, 
this is a rare opportunity for a social service organization and a very large health system to undertake a population level intervention and measure it. So UPMC is a leader in its space um, in taking care of its patients and members in a holistic way. The aligned plan and provider system definitely aids that. And their researchers should be used in the right way. They're specialists for a reason. And syncing with a partner like DDT has allowed us to smoothly and in tandem kind of combine the power of social services with um, you know, and meeting social needs with uh, healthcare in a more traditional sense. And the availability of data that UPNC provides will give us a really clear and strong proof of concept for the power of benefits access. They've been amazing partners um, in slogging through all of the tough parts. We're so lucky to be able to work with the Center for High Value Healthcare, which Suzanne will talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, you know, everything from contracting to data transfer processes to financial alignment, it's been, um, those are all usually the tough parts and it's been um, a really successful uh, effort to date. And it's a, it's a really special partnership. Um, secondly, I know the folks in this audience know this all too well, Combining and supercharging the power of data is tough. Breaking down those silos of data is tough. Um, data sharing arrangements are tough to broker. Uh, you know, through dedication and expertise on both sides here, we've been able to automate data transfer processes and really combine these two highly useful sets of data, put the right security in place and protect the privacy of the members while we're making sure we're taking care of them. And thirdly, this is the overall care model of really demonstrating how the system should work. This is a blueprint for a long-term and sustainable relationship, and we believe we're really advancing and adding momentum to how to embed SDOH interventions into the entire care ecosystem. Um, so with that, I will pass it to Suzanne. Thank you. I think I will try to grab the slides. And while we wait for that, maybe we could advance to the next one and then I could start talking about, uh, there we go, yay. Ta-da. Ah, technology. So I'm Suzanne Kinski. I'm happy to represent the UPMC Center for High Value Healthcare. Um, we are a nonprofit research shop that is housed underneath the UPMC Insurance Services Division, which is located within the Integrated Delivery and Financing System of UPMC, which is located in Western Pennsylvania. Um, we, as a center, were established in 2011, um, and our original goal was to capitalize on some of the changes coming from the Affordable Care Act. Um, and we have since expanded um, quite a lot in terms of the scope of work that we do. Um, a lot of our primary research is done with the help of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. We are currently a recipient of, I think, six PCORIs at this point, um, all, um, a lot, most of which are comparative effectiveness studies looking at different models of care um, with some of our member population. Um, we exist within a region that, that has a ton of academic research happening. Um, and so we leverage that by also partnering with, not necessarily as sort of the, the primary researchers, but um, in partnership with UPMC clinicians to understand the impact of service delivery innovations. Some of the schools from the University of Pittsburgh, such as the School of Medicine or the School of Public Health. Um, Carnegie Mellon is another one, other national organizations like AHIP, for example, and then this, obviously, um, is an example of a partnership um, where we work together with external entities to try to, uh, as Ashley said, combine our data to answer really interesting questions. Um, so this has been quite a quite an interesting, uh, there we go, ah, quite an interesting uh, intellectual challenge to really understand what is the best research design to answer the questions that we have. Um, so our, the primary question is really about like what is the impact of enrolling in SNAP on outcomes that are important to the healthcare system, including the CHC um, line of business. And it's particularly interesting to CHC because 
that entire line of business from a health insurer standpoint is the focus on keeping people in the community um, and aging in place, as Clem said, or as he said, transitioning them back into the community for folks who have been institutionalized, um, figuring out a way to support them elsewhere um, so that they they move out of an institution. And so a service like this, I think, is is really critical to understand how that works and if it works. So situations like this make a waitlist design really attractive because when we started talking about how we could conduct this study, we realized there's only so many people that BDT can conduct outreach to within a given month, right? So if we, we couldn't just hand over a list of 11,000 people and have them all instantly be contacted. Um, and so what we did is um, select folks for either immediate or delayed outreach. And we've selected them on a two to one basis. And then we're going to observe um, who enrolls in SNAP benefits for the cohort that was uh, selected for immediate BDT outreach. And what we'd like to do is get around the self-selection bias by using propensity score matching to select a sample of the delayed outreach who appear very similar to the folks who eventually enrolled in SNAP benefits from the immediate outreach. Um, and that will help us get a clearer sense of what SNAP impact is. Based on um, BDT's data, as they've been doing this for a long time, we understand that we could estimate maybe 12 to 18 percent of people who are contacted would ultimately enroll in SNAP benefits. Um, throughout all of this, as we planned out our sample size, we were as conservative as possible to understand uh, or to estimate who, who would be eligible from the CHC standpoint, um, how many people we could estimate to be enrolled. I think we're hoping that we ultimately see more people enrolled in SNAP benefits. Um, but we wanted to, to be as safe as possible. So we're looking at um, essentially a difference in difference analysis with a 12 month pre and post period. So we're looking at the 12 months prior to SNAP enrollment and the 12 months after SNAP enrollment. Um, we're going to, uh, our primary dependent variable that we're interested in is the rates of hospital utilization. Although we've identified several other secondary outcomes of interest, the hospital, hospital utilization outcome is the one that we powered on. Um, and we have enough folks in our intervention and comparison group to detect a 6% difference in a hospitalization rate. Again, based on our pretty conservative estimate, um, but that's pretty meaningful to us as an insurer um, in terms of um, impact for the patient or the member and impact to us in terms of, of cost and impact to the healthcare system. Um, the propensity matching will be based on variables that we can see as an insurer, so things like age, sex, um, residents, the Charlton Comorbidity Index, which is an indicator of chronic disease burden, and then CHC insurance details, which is sort of a shorthand way of saying um, which specific subcategory of CHC insurance are they? So things like, are they nursing facility ineligible or do they get home and community-based services? Um, what region are they in? Um, that kind of thing. And then in terms of our timeline, where we are right now, we received approval. Uh, we, we applied for IRB approval from the University of Pittsburgh, who is our IRB of record, um, and they declined to review and instead directed us to the UPMC Internal Quality Improvement um, Office, which issued our approval in the beginning of July. Um, and then outreach began at the beginning of this month. We've spent a lot of time going back and forth trying to figure out the most uh, efficient and safest way to share data back and forth. We anticipate wrapping up our 12-month post-observation period in about a year and a half. And I think I will pass it off to Rachel now for commentary. All right, terrific. Thanks, Suzanne. Can, every, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Rachel Cahill, and I am a pol currently a policy and research consultant. I work out of Ohio, um, but I've worked on SNAP and public benefits, uh, both from the policy side and the research side for 12 or so years. Um, I previously was uh, worked on some of the research studies at BDT when I was the director of policy there from 2012 to 2016. So I was involved in the original Maryland study, um, as well as the MIT study that this research really builds on. Um, and you know, what I, when I learned that uh, BDT and UPMC were going to be involved in this project, you know, I was really excited 
for the field. Um, I think the way that I see it, you know, we know that food security is a critical factor for older adults, especially who want to age in place um, safely and with dignity, right? And as Ashley mentioned, you know, we know from prior research and from other folks' research, some of much of which was funded by RWJ in its initial stages, you know, more than five years ago, um, that these dual eligibles receiving SNAP, you know, are less likely to be hospitalized and are a nursing home. They have better um, medication adherence, a whole host of, of benefits that come from it. Um, and as this audience probably knows, this evidence, you know, it mirrors those of other critical social determinants of health. So, you know, something like housing security, we have good evidence now to know that it makes a big difference. Um, but the question is sort of how will the healthcare system embrace it and how will we pay for those, those resources, um, you know, in, in the Medicaid, Medicare and private insurance environment. So, you know, what I think is the difference between um, food insecurity and housing insecurity is that we have this resource, SNAP, you know, food, the food stamp program, um, that's really one of our nation's last remaining entitlements, you know, meaning everybody that's eligible can receive it right away. Um, so there are no wait lists, um, as there are for many other, you know, critical social supports. Um, SNAP benefits, they're 100% federally funded. Um, the average benefit for a senior is around $110 a month. So we're talking about a, you know, a substantial ongoing resource for vulnerable individuals who are living on their own in the community. Um, and so, you know, so we're talking about a social, a way to address the social determinants of health where there's a substantial resource that is readily available and that the healthcare sector can serve as a connector to that resource. Um, but doesn't necessarily need to figure out how to pay for the resource itself. So it's not figuring out how to pay for the food. It's figuring out how to just connect people to this existing resource. And so, I mean, I, I often say like it's quite literally the low hanging fruit because it's, it's doable. Like this is a way that we can at scale connect people um, to a food resource in a, in a way that's sort of financially viable to um, where the healthcare system can, can play a, a critical connector role. And the other thing that I think is cool about this project is that the payer here, right, UPMC, saw this value proposition and they felt um, that it was worth investing in a dedicated outreach and enrollment partnership with BDT and with the P Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. Um, you know, it didn't take, I think this is really important, it really didn't take a grant from RWJ or someone else to make this cross-sector initiative happen. There was enough evidence and they saw it in their own vested interest to make the partnership sort of independently of any grant proposal. Um, but then, you know, S4A came along as an opportunity to really study this unique intervention and, you know, it would have been a shame to miss that opportunity. So this gives us a chance, gives them a chance to look at how quickly these cost savings um, of access to this additional food resource materialize, and then how the payer and the state use that information to make future investment or even regulatory decisions, you know, about, for instance, what a managed care um, entity that's integrating uh, home and community-based services, like what kind of services should be part of a, of a package for a managed care unit. So I think it has broad implications um, for how, you know, you, again, you take evidence, you take research, and you, you make it meaningful in, in, a, in a substantive way that drives decision, decisions from large institutions like an insurer and like our state, the state of Pennsylvania. And, you know, and I'll, again, say with my perspective as somebody in the SNAP policymaking space, and as an observer of the research progress that's been made in this field really in just the last, you know, five to seven years, I think it's, I think it's also kind of the, exactly the kind of projects that we need to learn whether the healthcare sector, you know, has a, a real vested um, tangible interest in seeing SNAP participation, um, to see seeing SNAP participation rates increase, and also just protecting SNAP and other programs from, um, you know, ongoing attacks, budget cuts, things that happen in the space that could undermine these critical resources that we're sh we've shown now, you know, pretty convincingly are saving uh, and can save dollars in the healthcare context. So I think it's a cool project and I'm, I'm eager to talk about it some more with uh, all the folks on the phone. And I guess I'll turn it back to uh, maybe Carrington or Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, really interesting um, study of folks have 
uh, questions, um, don't hesitate to uh, send uh, send us a, a chat. Uh, send send us our question. Send us a question via chat, um, and I'll go ahead and, and read them out loud. Um, so we already have uh, one uh, from An Andrew Anderson. Um, why don't we have a measure for Medicaid managed care plans that uh, assessing the extent to which people eligible for SNAP are screened and connected to benefits? Uh, and that's not directed to anyone specifically, so um, I guess rock, paper, scissor it. Uh, Suzanne, do you have a thought on that? I have a thought on this, but I'll let the, the insurer uh, entity speak first <laughs> if you have thoughts. I don't, yeah, I was going to say you're probably in a better, uh, a better place to answer that because you have a, a broader than a state view. Um, I might kick it to Clem because he's, he's much more in the middle of like the business end of, of Medicaid. And I'll say that I think, I think it's a great idea. I mean, obviously. Yeah. Well, uh, what was the question yeah. again? Sure. Uh, why don't we have a measure for Medicaid managed care plans uh, that assesses the extent to which people eligible for SNAP are screened and connected to benefits? Um, so what we are finding on the CHC end is that um, even if we did put a measure, um, sometimes participants, um, the process of getting participants to qualify is very convoluted. So I say that, for example, um, even though our participants are Medicaid eligible, whenever we are doing the screening, we still have to do the financial, um, the financial, financial counseling again. And that is a very cumbersome process. So in the way, even if we were to insert that um, point in there, it just, it makes it makes the process even longer and usually on the insurance and our goal is to get the participants enrolled in services as quickly as possible. But that is something that we should um, honestly insert into our process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add that, um, you know, I, I do think there's been conversation around uh, the country, or at least in some states, about this and, uh, you know, among other measures um, to put into, you know, for instance, I live in Ohio and we're sort of recontracting out our managed care plans or in the process of, of doing that massive uh, process for our Medicaid plans. And so we're talking a lot about um, social determinant measures that could be embedded there. Um, as Clem said, it can be a really difficult process and that's highly dependent on how difficult the state makes it <laughs> to enroll. And so, um, you know, there certainly there's an argument to be made from the insurer's perspective that it's a measure that's out of their control, but I think you can put in you could potentially put in measures that um, have to do with uh, an opportunity to enroll, so it, um, you know, an expectation to do outreach, an expectation to do education, to include it in resources that is you know, similar to the way UPMC is doing with BDT right now. I think that's realistic, even if the actual enrollment expectations are you know, somewhat out of the control of, uh, of the external stakeholders. Uh, that's, that's great. So it, it seems like the um, you know barrier to um, sign up for SNAP isn't only a matter of just not knowing um, uh, that they're eligible, but also um, that you know it's it's a it's not a a ton uh, of, of money, and sometimes the calculation can just be um, that the difficulty of of signing up um, isn't worth the benefit, which um, isn't necessarily um, true. Is that is that a fair ass assessment, um, uh, Rachel? Yeah, I would even go further that to, than that to say, I've ha it's rare that folks, unless they're receiving the minimum benefit, it's rare that folks who are food insecure will say it is not worth it. They will do a lot <laughs> to, to go through the enrollment process, but you can do everything right and still um, not succeed. We, we're talking about a program that has uh, a mandatory interview, you have to provide income verification, household composition, you know, um, non-citizen status, uh, 
verification of utility expenses. I mean, there's a lot of verification. Um, some states uh, BDT has partnered with have really streamlined the process. There's a number of choices states can make to make it much easier. So to take information, for instance, uh, the income information that's already been verified for Medicaid and use it to generate a SNAP application. So there's a way to do it that's much uh, easier, but the standard way that in most states SNAP enrollment uh, occurs really is through this very cumbersome process. So uh, we see often, you know, sort of devastatingly folks try hard and, you know, still, still don't succeed. But I think partnerships with community-based organizations and stakeholders like uh, payers in the space can exert a lot of pressure on a state agency to streamline this process, you know, with the argument that everyone benefits, you know, the individual who gets the food resource benefits, but also the state benefits because ultimately they're on the hook for a lot of these healthcare costs. Yeah, and this is Ashley. Uh, I just wanted to fall into what Rachel said, which is all um, extraordinarily true. And we find, you know, that's how BDT has kind of curated its service model is to address all of those issues with collecting documentation and, uh, you know, walking an individual through the actual application to the screening process is you know, being able to educate someone on how many, uh, how, how much of the benefit they're eligible for and to dispel that myth that it's not that much um, is something that is a big, you know, part of kind of converting the conversation to an actual application as well. And, you know, our BDT recognizes, you know, through the policy work we do that, you know, helping states, like Rachel said, know their choices for simplifying applications uh, and making it easier for folks who don't have transportation um, or face other obstacles is a big piece of our work. So um, just wanted to add that. Thank you for those responses. We um, have two questions um, from the audience. Uh, one is from uh, anonymous attendee. Um, will the collaboration with the state be limited to the data slash list sharing or will the Department of Human Services be involved in other steps in the research? And now and I'll open that up to any of you. So this is Suzanne. I, I can chime in real quick. The, the state is DHS is supportive of this project. Um, the collaboration with them is really limited to the confirming um, eligibility and SNAP enrollment. Um, although I know that, you know, outside of this particular research question that we're trying to answer, there's a, there's a much broader collaboration that happens um, between BDT and DHS and UPMC and DHS, but maybe some of my colleagues can speak to, to some of those. And the last question, uh, what percentage of MCD members are eligible for SNAP? Of, of which members, sorry? Uh, MCD members. I'm, uh, Medicaid, Medicaid. Medicaid, okay. Ashley, do you want to answer that or do you want me to take it? Yeah, why don't you take it? Okay. Um, so my, this is my take is that if these are, um, if all the Medicaid managed care members that we're talking about um, are, as Clem said, under 133% of the poverty line um, and are eligible and enrolled in Medicaid, they are eligible for SNAP. Um, SNAP has in Pennsylvania, 160% of the poverty line is the gross income limit for all households and for senior and disabled households, it's actually higher than that. Um, so, so on the eligibility, uh, based on the eligibility criteria of income alone, everyone should be eligible. And based on um, the fact that the SNAP program doesn't have an asset test and the Medicaid program in some cases does, um, you know, there, there shouldn't be any members who are not eligible. The only folks who might, who would be ineligible are those who um, are in and out of a nursing home. And if they're actively um, residing in a nursing home at the time they apply, they would not be eligible because their meals are provided as part of the nursing home. But if they're living in the community, they should qualify for SNAP. All right, well, if there aren't any additional questions um, from, uh, from the 
from attendees. Um, I will go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you um, for, for presenting. Um, this is uh, amazing information. That'd be really helpful. Oh, wait. We do have one last question in 10 minutes. Um, so if we're okay with um, ask, squeezing this in really quickly. Um, yeah, let's do it. All right. Can do attitude. Um, Laura Boggs would like to know how many other states offer additional benefits to SNAP, such as entry to cultural facilities? I don't know that I totally understand the question. Maybe the, uh, the commenter can add a little bit, maybe an example. Um, so I think what they're getting at is like free fruits and, and vegetables, like access to, to food. Uh, oh, like yes. Okay. Sure. Yeah, um, so I, so it's a great question. I don't, uh, I don't have a list of every state and every permutation of the things that SNAP benefits, uh, SNAP enrollment entitles you to, but it's a really good point that SNAP is often a gateway to many other um, social services or free resources in a community. I can say just in my own community, you know, there are discounted, you can get a discounted bus pass. You can get, um, yeah, a free, you know, free taking your kids to the movies or a whole bunch of cultural activities that uh, SNAP enrollment sort of entitles you to access to. It's also on a, uh, again, in the kids space, it entitles you to free school meals. It entitles you in some cases to automatic enrollment into LIHEAP, which is energy assistance. So it's a huge, Kind of gateway benefit if you want to think of it that way because the eligibility and enrollment process is so robust. Um, some, a few states have even used SNAP enrollment as um, essentially predetermining you eligible for Medicaid and so they don't have to go through the Medicaid enrollment process if you're already enrolled in SNAP. So I, we often um, think of SNAP as just the dollars that it infuses into the household which are significant um, but there are all these other sort of uh, downfall or waterfall effects, I should say, that come with SNAP enrollment, which is another reason why we want participation rates to be really high. So thanks for that question. Awesome. Um, and, uh, and I guess I do have a, a, a final question. Um, I'm, I'm curious about um, the referrals once folks are um, brought in to do um, applications. Um, are any of the CBOs um, legal in nature? Um, definitely a, a, um, a suppressant on, um, on um, actually um, receiving benefits is receiving benefits and losing them due, due to the cumbersome nature. Um, and I'm just curious if uh, any of the uh, CBOs um, that you're referring folks to um, are, are uh, law firms or are legal practices. Are you speaking from BDT's perspective or uh, the health plan's perspective? Uh, from the health plan. I'm actually not sure um, about that, and I wonder, Clem, if you have an answer to that in terms of the kinds of social services referrals that care managers give to CHC members. Um, yes, so um, we, um, a lot of, our, um, we have a resource list of um, housing, um, housing, food, and, um, food, um, counseling. We 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 have a resource list that we usually send to our members. Late, lately, the past few weeks, we've been actually receiving a lot of requests for housing. So that's really what we are really looking to build out right now. But in terms of what we we send to members, members usually ask a wide range of things that we provide for them. Thank you. Um, we have another, one last question uh, from Lynn Mertz. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I'll try to give it a go. Um, are people being denied access to other services because they did not go through the SNAP process?
Uh, Rachel, I don't know if that's a question you've gotten before, but I can't, maybe if it means a certain type of auto enrollment, um, if that's what the questioner is asking about. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. I, I think a clarification would be really helpful. So Lynn, are you, uh, are you able to, to clarify a bit? Oh, uh, Lynn says it's uh, building off the comment of states using the SNAP, using SNAP as a gateway verifier. Oh yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, Thank so you. so in the, in this case, you know, SNAP, it can, it is certainly true that if you um, fall off of SNAP, if you, you know, you apply and then get disenrolled because you couldn't manage uh, or navigate the recertification process, for instance, that that can also have, um, you know, waterfall effects and it, we see it most um, sort of uh, directly with school meals enrollment is that a household will fall off of SNAP and then it's called a direct certification process and that process breaks down when the SNAP enrollment can't be verified and it can affect not just that individual family which is of course worrisome but it can also affect a whole school district because oftentimes if you have a high enough volume of enrollment um, the school can serve can afford to serve free meals to everyone without having to do individual applications and so when you see snap participation across a community it's almost like if you th you think of the way our uh, vaccines work and you know communities all being protected when you have a high enough vaccination rate it's the same thing with snap if you have a high enough participation rate everyone is covered by those school meals, but once that rate starts to drop below a certain threshold, then the, the school loses universal meals um, eligibility and you have to go back to an individual application um, process. So, so not only getting folks enrolled in SNAP, but also keeping them enrolled in SNAP is, um, is really critical. Fortunately for seniors and persons with disabilities, there are longer certification periods and it's a little bit more streamlined to keep them enrolled because their eligibility tends to be more stable. Um, but it's it's a critical uh, goal and something that we are constantly encouraging states to pay more attention to. Uh, thank you for that response. Um, in the interest of, uh, interest of time, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, thank you so much to uh, all the presenters today. Um, and uh, one last re reminder uh, that our call for proposals is, is still open until um, November the 6th. And if you want additional information, uh, look us up on systemsforaction.org. Uh, and again, the deadline is November 6th. Um, so uh, until next time, um, you guys have a, have a great day. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>